Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to this 2020 primary election candidate forum for the 22nd district legislative position number one. The forum is presented by the League of Women Voters of Thurston County, along with Thurston Community Media, TCM. This forum is being held electronically. Candidates, moderators, and timers are joining us on Zoom links with the help of TCM. A bit about the League. The League is a nonprofit organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens and their government. The League neither supports or opposes candidates or parties. We are nonpartisan. The League registers new voters. We study issues and advocate for its positions with the legislature and other governmental bodies. Despite its name, the League is open to all people ages 16 and up. I'm Annie Coverly from the League and I'll be moderating this forum. A timer will show a sign when you have 30 seconds left and then again when you need to stop. The candidates for this position are Alan Acosta, Lori Dolan, J.D. Ingram, and Johnny Mead. For this forum, candidates will have one minute to respond to a question about qualifications, followed by a series of questions in alternating order and ending with a one minute closing statement. The first question is why are you the most qualified candidate for this position? We're gonna begin with Alan Acosta and then Lori Dolan, then JD Ingram and then Johnny Mead. Each candidate has one minute to respond. So um, Alan, you wanna start? Yep, uh, again, my name is Alan Acosta. Um, uh, extensive service in the U.S. Army as a military officer. Uh, I have a degree in Eastern Michigan from Eastern Michigan as a um, public safety administration uh, concentration and criminal investigation. I've done uh, uh, numerous work in this uh, legislative district uh, 22 um, and also a lot of political activism um, on campus uh, and working with um, both sides of the uh, uh, the spectrum and uh, getting uh, um, legislation through when it regards to individual rights and also um, businesses um, to make sure that they have lots of choices and take her out take out the barriers of regulation. So uh, I continue to work those and advocate and um, I continue to stay in touch with the legislative district 22 uh, in the community and making sure that uh, their voice is heard on campus. Um, so. I've uh, been doing that for uh, numerous years and, uh, and a lot of community activism to maintain the pulse in, uh, within my community. Thank you. Um, Lori Dolan. Thank you. Um, so I bring a wealth of legislative experience, both proposing, writing and passing legislation. For the past four years, I've been the position one representative for the 22nd legislative district and able to pass uh, many important bills along the way. Before that, I was Chris Gregoire's policy director. So I did all the policy in all aspects of state government on behalf of the governor from 2005 to 2009. But perhaps more important, I spent 30 years in K-12 education in the Spokane Public Schools. Thank you. J.D. Ingram. Hi, my name is J.D. Ingram. I'm running for state representative, as you know. Uh, I'm not a career politician. I consider myself a lifelong Republican uh, with strongly held conservative beliefs. I've spent much of my adult life working and raising my family. Uh, I'm qualified because I believe in you. I believe in your ability to run your life with minimal interference from the government our nation was founded on the principle of individual liberty. We need government, just less government than we've been getting. Thank you. Johnny Mead. Eric, I'm no longer muted. Um, so I, um, my name is Johnny Mead and I am running because um, I am a working class father in this district and I feel like the working class people in this district aren't being represented in the way that they need to be. Um, we, you know, I'm an essential worker. Um, and right now in the coronavirus, um, it's, um, you know, it's showing the underlying problems in our system. And so the experience that I bring into this 
Um, whereas, you know, I've been a uh, get off the boat organizer, I've worked in housing advocacy. Um, my experience is that of somebody within the working class living in this community for 12 years and working to represent those people moving forward. Thank you. Uh, I think that's everybody. Yeah, I think we got everybody. Okay, so the next one is um, the, this following question. The first respondent has two minutes and subsequent respondents have one minute to respond. So I'll rotate questions among the candidates so that each candidate has a chance to start first. So how, um, so the first one is how will you address funding for the transportation projects in light of I-970 and the costs of the pandemic. So this time we'll start with you, Laurie. So, so that's actually one of the toughest questions you could ask because um, probably our transportation budget uh, with both the initiative situation as well as a $4 billion hole in the state budget right now is getting hit the worst. Over the summer, um, we really tried to scrape together enough money to do, get the most important transportation projects to keep moving forward. But um, once we come back to special session, probably to relook at the budgets, we're going to have to redo that. I mean, unlike the federal government, state government can't print money when we need it. And so we have to actually balance a budget. So we're just going to have to prioritize work with local local communities to determine which of those projects are the most urgent in terms of safety going forward and prioritize them and start from the top of that priority list because there's not gonna be enough money to do the transportation projects we had, we had planned to do when the voters passed that initiative and when we left on March 12th thinking that um, our budget was good and gonna be in place and all that has now been blown apart with COVID-19. So it's going to be prioritizing the most urgent things and starting at the top of that list. Thank you. Uh, the next person would be JD. Uh, thank you. Uh, many of our transportation projects, I feel, have been neglected because there's been a, a split between what's supposed to go for roads and what's supposed to go for mass transit. Uh, I believe that our mass transit projects should fund themselves. I don't think they should be relying on tax revenue for support. I think the tax revenue at the gas pump was intended to go for roads and that's where it should go. Thank you. Okay. Johnny Mead. Well, I think that this speaks to a larger issue that we have um, with, with in terms of funding the state budget overall. And rather than pointing to the fact that we need to do austerity on these issues, we need to be sourcing um, alternative, reliable um, modes of funding these projects moving forward, rather than saying that we just don't have the ability to do it. There's, there's fundamental problems um, with our tax code that are preventing us from moving forward in a progressive direction. Thank you. Alan Acosta? Uh, most definitely uh, looking at the, uh, as uh, Representative uh, Dolan said about uh, the budget, we definitely need to start as a go state government uh, prioritizing uh, uh, these projects uh, with the transportation. And um, one of the things that JD has uh, touched upon is uh, something that I've been looking at at uh, the last few years is how do we uh, privatize, uh, especially our mass transit system. Um, there's there's many uh, there's many effects and uh, positive effects uh, by doing that. Um, also, uh, bringing um, uh, jobs into their community and uh, 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 in new independent business owners, um, and then taking that away. Uh, privatizing definitely helps us. Um, uh, one takes those off our, our the state books, and also um, there's a lot a lot more cost efficient ways of um, uh, running uh, mass transit. Uh, in the state. And um, uh, we have to balance just like all the families have to do. The government has to start balancing their checkbook as well. And so most definitely looking at the projects and prioritizing uh, what is uh, the need. Thank you. 
So the next question is, would you support raising state revenue through the capital gains tax on higher income people? So this one, we're gonna start with um, JD Ingram. Thank you. Um, I don't favor any tax increases of any kind for any reason. I think that uh, government has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. I think there's, there's more than enough money at the state level also the federal level, I know we're talking state here, uh, but that's that's my bottom line on it. Uh, if, if money needs to come in for something, if we really need to fund something, then great. Let's, let's look in our wallet and figure out where it's gonna come from, but let's not talk about raising new taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Johnny Mead? Oh, well, I mean, we live in a state where um, some of the richest individuals in the world live. And I think a capital gains tax is certainly um, one avenue of getting revenue. The problem with a capital gains tax is that um, it is, you know, those corporations, those individuals are going to find loopholes. So I think that we really need to be moving forward for alternative modes. Um, capital gains tax, that's part of that, but it's not the, uh, the primary source because it's too easy for corporations to avoid. So going back, we need to have the political will to move forward so that we can have an equitable tax system in the state of Washington. Thank you. Alan Acosta? Uh, yes, one of the, the most important thing after this, after the post-COVID uh, for the recovery is getting people back to work. And uh, one of the things that we need, definitely need to start looking at is looking at uh, the regulation portion. Um, uh, repealing some of the uh, certification and needs, especially for our healthcare workers, have been uh, decimated. And what that will do also is prepare us for any future uh, emergency uh, um, um, crisis that might come come down the line. Things as uh, uh, simple things as um, uh, business business licensure laws that we that's uh, inhib inhibiting the cottage food industry um, and getting getting small businesses and getting new businesses back. Uh, opportunities to uh, uh, add to the recovery and the economy. Um, so uh, that's what I'd like to take a look at as current uh, and to try to deregulate and repeal some of these uh, um, regulations. Thank you. Laurie Dolan. So our system, our tax system in Washington state is one of the most regressive in the United States because we rely on B&O tax, property tax and sales tax. The problem with our B&O tax is that hits our businesses, both small and large, um, unfairly. They are actually, by default, paying income tax through their B&O tax. If we could get rid of depending on the B&O tax and go to a capital gains tax, that would actually help probably some of our wealthiest citizens in Washington state. The capital gains tax would have to be for the very wealthy, people who sell stocks and bonds and get more than $250,000 at a time in interest gains. Those are the people who would pay the capital gains tax. They come to the legislature, many of them, and tell, tell us how much they would be willing to pay that because they're lucky to be as wealthy as they are because of Washington state and the economy that we have here. They want to pay for roads. They want to pay for um, all those infrastructure things. I'll stop there. Thank you. So the next question is, what steps will you take to ensure that people of color are treated fairly by law enforcement and within the criminal justice system? Um, and this one will start with Johnny. Getting myself un unmuted here. Um, you know, across the board, uh, there are systemic issues and we need to address them. You know, there's no, there's no one size fits all solution, but um, we need to be providing for the basic needs of individuals that um, have been marginalized by our society. We need to be, um, you know, we put so much money into policing, um, but we don't put money into into housing and to helping um, our, our marginalized folks. And so I feel that, uh, you know, we, we need to fundamentally look from the, um, from the top down at our uh, criminal justice system 
and you know do something different and and just a, you know going at it from a uh, perspective of just the criminal justice system isn't going to solve the problem because the the underlying issue is that people's needs are not being met and they're not being met by historical inequalities that are baked into our system and so we need to uh, address those first and foremost um, which means housing uh, education providing opportunities to people of color um, that are not um, currently available to them thank you alan acosta oh um so we definitely you know what we've seen in the the last couple of weeks of what's going on across the nation especially here in washington state um, we definitely need to start looking at uh, uh, some of our uh, practices and um, when it comes to law enforcement. The thing that we need to get involved is, uh, again, the, the unions, uh, the citizens. I'd like to see a citizen board uh, oversight uh, uh, over their precincts and the police departments and uh, also getting the unions involved, um, how, to, how to move forward. Uh, one of the things, too, is the overcriminalization um, that we have. Uh, we need to look at some of these minor offenses that uh, may, might cause some uh, contentious um, uh, citizen to police contact that might not be necessary, which can escalate to um, uh, something that uh, what we've seen in the uh, last couple of weeks with, uh, um, with, with uh, George Floyd. Um, some of the things, too, is looking at um, privatization of some aspects uh, the scope of work with the police department and uh, uh, continue to work with leaders uh, in, in, the, in the community to uh, find a way ahead. Uh, again, it's not working, so uh, let's try to find something else uh, that will work. Okay. Laurie Dolan. So I, I really agree with a lot of what Johnny and Alan just shared. Um, we watched the movie Just Mercy last night in my household, and there was a line in there that has been resonating in my brain ever since last night. And the line was, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. And I think all sorts of Americans, all races of Americans are out protesting in the streets right now because of what we watched with George Floyd was untenable. That can't happen in the United States of America. So we passed 940 as a state a couple of years ago. We already are on this path to uh, better controlling police use of deadly force. We need to get independent investigations. We need to work with unions. Those two things are really important as the next steps that we need to approach. We can do this. Washingtonians care about justice. Thank you. J.D. Ingram. I don't think there's a simple solution. I, I think part of the problem, it's far bigger than law enforcement. It's our total, uh, our total view of each other. There's an old proverb that says, there are two groups of people in this world, those who go putting everybody into two groups and those who don't. And when you start, there's a follow up to that is, when you start putting people into groups, you start marginalizing people, you start treating them as less than the human that we all are. I try to look at everybody as a part of the human race, and I try very hard not to look at people as color, other than color, however you want to phrase it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next question is, how should the state of Washington address climate change? And we're gonna start with um, Alan Acosta. Um, so I've been working with a lot of uh, um, a lot of nonprofits uh, that deal with uh, climate advocacy and education. I think that's the best place to start right now and um, to uh, start changing our behavior and minimizing our 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 impact on the environment. And um, even um, I've been focused on that in the last couple of years because my child is actually. Um, uh, incorporated some of these uh, practices. And it's really hard uh, to change those behaviors, especially the ones that we were, were common to address. But uh, I think if we start incorporating a lot of these um, uh, uh, 
climate education and advocacy uh, into uh, our curriculum, uh, how to minimize those impacts. It will set the strategic picture and precedence in the future of uh, uh, minimizing, especially looking at new technologies that have um, minimal impact and uh, within the environment. So we just need to start looking at that and start looking at the future starting as, as soon as it's today and incorporating that in the uh, education curriculum. Thank you. Uh, Laurie Dolan. So this last legislative session, we actually passed 25 different bills to make um, improved climate in, in our environment. And um, this is critical to me. This is actually the most critical, critical thing we're going to talk about because without an earth that where we can survive as human beings, the rest of this becomes kind of less important. The pieces that we passed were working on plastic bags. We're keeping toxins out of the water. We passed a sequestration bill to give farmers um, opportunity to sequest uh, their carbon with their crops. The piece we haven't gotten to yet, um, to put, which puts our governor and our democratic caucus in angst is we still haven't done the clean fuel standards. We could have passed that in the house this past session, but the Senate wasn't ready to vote on it. We need to get that passed. Thank you. Um, J.D. Ingram. I believe the whole issue of climate change has been unfortunately and irretrievably politicized. Um, the carbon tax, as far as I'm concerned, is just another tax. It's another way to uh, actually harm our economy by increasing our costs with no discernible benefit. Uh, and I'm just going to stop at that point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Johnny Mead. I mean, uh, this, this is, um, you know, well, you know, prior to the COVID-19 crisis coming and hitting us in the face, um, this was the, the overarching crisis that we need to deal with. And it's still present there, even with coronavirus there. So um, we have so much work that we need to do to move our state to green and renewable energy. Um, we can provide jobs doing so through a green jobs guarantee. Um, and we need to have massive investment in solar and wind, offshore wind, and ensure that our local power resources are not being controlled by fossil fuel companies. And that they, if they are burning fossil fuels, that they're not able to just give us rate increases whenever that they deem fit. Um, so overall, you know, the state needs to divest from fossil fuels. Um, individual actions are nice but um, it really takes a concerted effort at the state level. Thank you. So the last, well, the last question before the closing statement is, how might the state of Washington address homelessness? Do you see it as a local issue or is a broader response needed? So this one, we're gonna start with, um, let's see, Laurie. Okay, thank you. So. Homelessness is an issue that's local, it's county, it's state, and it's federal. So I see it at every single level of government. What we were able to do last session is we actually passed $135 million of new spending for the, the homeless account, which was basically more than we've ever spent before. I'm hoping with our $4 billion hole in the budget, we can still keep that pretty whole because we've got to provide We've got to keep the, the affordable housing that we already have in place, and we need to be able to build more affordable housing. And to do that costs money. So, and it, to, a lot of that money is going to local government so they can spend it in whatever place they need it within their local geography. Um, the, I lost my train of thought, just a minute. <laughs> the, the other thing that we did with laws last year is we actually found the balance, we're trying to find the balance between landlords and the renters. That there's, there's a balance there because the, the people who own the property, this is their living. We, we need to make sure they can make a living. We want them to have that property that people can rent. The people that are renting the property need to be able to get into homes. One example of a bill we passed is we had um, a bill that if 
you're moving into a new apartment, sometimes the biggest expense you have is the move-in costs. So we passed a bill that if you don't have the money and your move-in costs are more than 25% of what your monthly rent's going to be, you can actually pay your landlord for those move-in costs over, over like three or four months time. So that's just way, one way to make sure the landlord gets the money that he or she deserves and the renter can afford to actually move in. So that's just one simple bill that hopefully keeps that relationship between landlords and renters um, stable. Thank you. J.D. Ingram. Homelessness is obviously a complex solution. Uh, it involves many different issues. Uh, I, I can list a few. I'm sure I will miss a few, so it's not intentional that I miss any, but you have drug abuse, mental health, uh, poverty, uh, unemployment. That unemployment's never good at any time. I was going to say at an awkward time, but unemployment's always awkward. But uh, I'd like to be very clear that I don't think government spending is the solution. Uh, anytime you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it. And unfortunately, I believe most of our so-called solutions toward homelessness that involve spending uh, are just subsidizing it and we're getting more of it rather than really finding solutions. I do think this is where the government needs to get out of the way of nonprofits and private businesses. I don't think government can solve this problem because I frankly, I think government is partially responsible for causing it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Johnny Mead. No, I, I, I think it's ironic to say that the government, you know, the cause of the problem when it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the market that has failed these individuals. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I, I work downtown and I, I see um, people face to face, know them by name. And you know what we what they need is resources that the government can provide. We need public housing. We need behavioral health services where we're trying to work upstream to solve these problems before they get to crisis management. Because right now it's a one stop fits all. We call the police. They clear the camp. The camp moves to another spot, and then after those neighbors get annoyed, then the cops come, move the camp again. And you're not going to have a solution that doesn't involve actually housing the people that are unhoused. So I believe in providing public housing and behavioral health services to our most unfortunate. Thank you. Alan Acosta. Yeah, uh, so I've been working the, the homeless issues for almost close to a decade now. And uh, definitely I'd like to see more resources uh, 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 put towards that. And one of the things is, uh, that's very important is, um, mental, mental health and, uh, trauma care programs. And these are things that we can definitely work with, uh, universities and, uh, uh, the local private hospitals and, um, uh, the, the nonprofits that I've, I've worked with are, are doing an uh, amazing job, um, to, uh, continue to mitigate the issues in our local communities. Uh, another thing too that we definitely need to take a look at is our zoning laws and also our uh, the cost of permitting to, to build these homes. Um, um, I, you know, we need we need more homes. We need we need we need shelter. And in order to do that, you know, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, government regulations that are adding costs and um, that are making homes out of reach. You know, uh, uh, t uh, 20 years ago, um, you know, it was we were looking at uh, yeah, everybody we need to everybody's goal was to have a house. Um, but now that's, it's, uh, it's out of reach. Um, and now it's, uh, uh, and so we need to take a look at how to bring these costs of these homes down, let the builders do what they do best and build homes, uh, and so on. So, um, zoning laws, uh, take a look at that, um, Thank uh, you. housing affordability. Thank you. Okay. So we're down to the last um, closing statement. So each candidate has one minute to make a closing statement. And we're going to start with J.D. Ingram. Oh, thank you. As I started out saying, I, I believe in you. I believe in your ability to run your life with minimal government, government interference. We, yet we definitely need government, but we've got too much of it. 
Uh, if I'm elected, I will use the federal and state constitutions as my guide to carefully review all new laws and revisions to existing laws to ensure that they are constitutional, support individual liberty and personal freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Johnny Mead. So uh, coronavirus has uh, unveiled the uh, underlying problems in our society. And right now uh, we have students that are, you know, we're still up in the air on what's going back to school. As a father, I'm concerned um, about what kind of future is going to be available for my daughter moving forward. So I am putting forth a, a public broadband initiative so that we can get equitable education to all uh, students in the state of Washington to get through the coronavirus crisis because um, our people find out themselves on the edge of unemployment without health care. We have uh, 42,000 folks in Thurston County alone that are unemployed. And how are we going to get education to our students when they can't afford to pay the internet bill? We have the infrastructure there already. We just need the political will to be able to provide material resources to the people of our community, a community of which I am a part and I plan to represent. Thank you. Alan Augusta. I have worked on numerous legislation to advocate for individual rights and protection. Uh, I have spoken out against continued taxation at rallies, um, fighting for uh, fighting the cost of living increases that are making Washington uh, less affordable uh, for families. I work with the community outreaches, uh, addressing food insecurities and homelessness in our communities uh, to include Veteran Homelessness Task Force, a growing issue within the state. I am an advocate for affordable housing and zoning law reform. I'm a responsible steward of public lands and strong advocate for conservation education. Um, I am more than words and I want to continue my service to Legislative District 22. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Lori Dolan. Thank you. Um, so I've been in this job for four years now, and it's a job I love. I still have lots of energy to get a lot more done. Uh, four things that I passed that are pretty important is we got a civics education um, class in place that's a requirement for graduation. We got school safety centers put into each of our educational service districts to help with any help train teachers, school staff to deal with any kind of active shooter situation as well as teen suicide prevention. That's where we lose most our kids. So those services are now in place. And for our state employees, we just got a bill passed that if they are furloughed during this terrible economic time, they will now get their jobs back instead of having those jobs contracted out like they were in 2008. So that's that's a huge win for our state employees. I would deeply love to have your vote. I would love to continue as your representative for the next two years. And before I end, I wanna thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this forum. A lot of people watch this and we all appreciate your efforts on our behalf. Thank you. And thank you all for participating in this forum. Thanks to the Thurston Community Media for coordinating this forum using Zoom. The forum will be available on the, on the TCM channels and on the League website and through YouTube shortly after the forums are concluded. We're glad you've taken this opportunity to view this forum. We remind you to vote in the primary election beginning July 17th and closing August 4th, 2020. Thank you all. Thank you.